truly are of who you are. Um, as we stand and we look at, at you, we just bask in your love. Um, we try to understand your mercy and your grace. Um, but Lord, we truly uh, just want to know you more. We thank you for giving your son Christ, uh, Jesus, uh, to forgive us uh, of our sins. Um, Lord, thank you for Sorry about that. All right. So last time we were here, we spent pretty much the entire class reviewing, <laughs> which is okay. But um, I want to get to some new content today. Um, and you have those cards there in front of you. So that's where we're going to um, kind of... Uh, get to, and then we're going to kind of go back uh, and review a little bit. So we'll just see how the day goes. And I always joke with you guys about bringing candy bars. I don't know what the Baptist policy is for candy bars in the sanctuary. <laughs> but when we get to responses, Brother Danny brought enough that, you know, you all should leave here like your kids from um, Halloween. So uh, I'm drink a treat. So um, let's just get started. Um, remember, these, uh, this is one of the what we call a keystone pods for the ministries of sky watchers and gem seekers. This is what we have built our ministry around. So the different things on the front side of this building that you see are things that we, as a ministry to these young uh, boys, young girls, um, even with our men uh, ministry that we're starting now, these are things that we are intentionally working into those ministries. Okay, it is based upon these key passages uh, from Scripture, Genesis 1, as what Bob read, what it means that man is created in the image of God. And it's our goal to write it in a manner in which it is memorable, that you can understand it, uh, you can accept it as being truth, uh, you can apply it, you can articulate it, you can apply it, um, and also share it with those around you. Um, and you're going to see today, I think, when we get into this, uh, into the roof and even to the roof cap and the pillars, why this is so important. But we said one of the, other, uh, one of the second main verses uh, that we're using, a principle based, is from Proverbs 14. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Um, what is righteousness? You know, if, if we understand we're created in the image of God, how does that play into that? Um, we as a nation in the United States, we believe we were found on righteous principles. We are replacing those righteous principles. And now we're look, feeling like King David um, in Psalm 11 when he looks around and he says, where do the righteous go when the foundations are being destroyed? And so um, this leads us, of course, to Matthew 7, 
where uh, we see two different um, particular parts that we've pulled out of that larger passage. It starts in Matthew 5. Um, Matthew 7, you know, uh, narrow, truth is narrow. Uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction. You know, narrow is the way that leads to life. And then the end of Matthew 7 is the wise man built his house upon the rock. Uh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. So to help, help you understand, we're literally building this building, building this doctrine on man being created in the image of God, showing you, um, teaching you, so you can teach others absolutely how foundational um, this doctrine is. And everything that we do is always, of course, based in Scripture. And even those, the, the logical deductions that we look at and make, we realize that, you know, they're logical, but obviously, um, if they're true, they're going to be found biblically as well. So, um, this, is our, this is our building uh, that we have up. Uh, it, uh, the one side is obviously the principles of God that's built on the rocks. Um, this building, the, or the other side of the building, is built on sand. This is what we're seeing. And I would argue that brick for brick, pillar for pillar, when a nation is founded, this is what it would look like on righteousness. When it's founded on righteousness, this is what the society, the culture is going to look like. This is what we started with, at least the attempt to have this. And we've come in and we've replaced it. And now we shouldn't be surprised that these are the issues that we're seeing uh, in, our, in our world uh, today. And so when we're looking around and we're saying why, um, we had the Buffalo shooting, right? Why would somebody do that? Well, is it because guns are bad, or is it because he doesn't understand that made, a man's being made in the image of God? I would argue, I want you to think about this. At the end, we'll talk about it more. If the evolutionary process that we're teaching in our schools is true, then is buffalo really bad? Now, that sounds horrible. You would say, like, that's a terrible thing to say. It, it is a terrible thing to say, but it's what we're teaching. Okay, so I want you to see, um, again, in, in our world, when we believe you're found, you know, when man's created in the image of God, which is what we're studying, that what was done in Buffalo is absolutely horrific and evil, and, and we have the right to say that. Okay, so that's the building. We've gone through the floorboards. Remember, after we said the basic idea of man being created in the image of God is for us to represent, right? That's the first R word. Everybody got that? Represent. All right? You should have three cards that you should be memorizing. <laughs> so we represent. We off the idea of represent. We built those four floorboards. Um, and you've got those on your cards there that were uh, accountable. Um, I'm not on the floorboards right now. Uh, we're accountable. Here's the floorboards. <clears throat> we have an authority to which we're accountable. We're designed, and therefore we're distinct. Um, we have to ask the question, once we get to Genesis chapter 3, whether the image is removed or is it retained, and then um, is it exempt, or are there exemptions, or to what extent uh, is the image uh, bore? So everybody's got where we're at. Those connect the, the front and the back of the building, right? Then we went through and we laid the next blocks, and that was some of what we've done, uh, of what we've done over the past couple weeks. Um, but what I wanted, where I want to start today is on the pillars, I want to start right here. So everyone want to grab that card out? There's several apologetic groups that will use these four terms. So when you're looking at that, the, the side that has origin and meaning on it, that butts up to the front of the building. The side that has destiny and morality on the back side that back butts up to the back side of the meeting, or of the building. Now, the reason we wanted to include these, especially as the pillars, is because it's not just the Christian faith that has to answer these questions. These are questions, four questions, that every worldview has to answer. They have to. And what would, what would you be looking for if you were a truth seeker and were looking at different worldviews or different religions, if, the, if this was your 
standard. Okay, let's think about it. Origin is what? Our being. Origin, meaning. What, what's that? Why am I here? Okay, origin, meaning, morality. What's morality? What's right and wrong, good and evil. Okay, and then what? Destiny, which is where do you go when you die? Okay, so four simple words. Just pound them in your head. Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. It's like a really bad, you know, t-ball chant. Okay, <laughs> um, now, if you're a truth seeker and you're looking for, you know, if, 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 if this is your standard, how does the image of God answer this? What are some things you're looking for? In Christianity, we have, I've seen so many people get into conversations, and Corey, maybe you can back me up on this. You have people come and ask you, and say, I'm in a conversation with somebody, and they're asking me all these questions. What do you have the right to do as well? Ask them the same question. We find ourselves just you know, trying to answer questions, answer questions, answer questions. One of the best ways Christ did it, ask the question back. Okay? So, let's talk it through. Image of God. What's, how does that answer how does the doctrine of the image of God answer these four pillars? Origin. What's that? Created. Absolutely. I mean, the, that's kind of the big deal. Yeah. Okay. Give me another worldview and give me their origin answer. By the way, Abby here. <laughs> Give me another worldview. Big, Big Bang. So evolution would be um, uh, humanism would, would fall into that. Probably atheism would fall into that category. So origin from them. What is it? Evolution. So like what, like what is it? Like we said creation started God's voice. God used his voice to let there be man. Man was there. Maybe there wasn't the sound. I'm not sure how that sounds in, in Hebrew, but maybe. <laughs> okay. So what is the latest the latest Big Bang. Apes, but where did apes come from? Like, what was the bang? It was a, yeah. <laughs> Star gas is what the latest one is. I talked to a physicist one time. He told me the universe exists merely to, um, uh, merely to observe itself. Okay? So, what... Uh, what does that lead us, like, to the next pillar? Ver like, take those two concepts. Origin, we say created. Okay, they say Big Bang. What does that mean on the next pillar? Does your life have any meaning? What? Absolutely. Yeah. What is our reason for existence? Now, guys, one of the guys I used to listen to, listen to, listen to was a guy named Robbie Zacharias. I don't know if you guys know about his fall and all that different stuff. So when I, but what he had to say, that doesn't change it. What he had to say was often really good. Uh, you know, I, I literally read the thing on Robbie and sat in my chair and cried with my daughter, Esther. But, you know, Robbie would... Uh, would um, have people ask him one of the, you know, exactly what you said. And he said, you cannot question your existence without confirming it in, in, in the question. And so we're here. Somebody give me, like, what would you think the Truth Project, so Focus on the Family, they put out um, this uh, curriculum. And in it, they lead off with the percentage of Christians that actually have a Christian worldview. I mean, want to take a guess on what they found? Dad knows. He's seen it. From the Christians that, that, that you know, how many Christians actually have a coherent, consistent, biblical, Christ-centered worldview? Give me a guess on the percentage. 35. 
Do I hear that's way high? If you're in Price is Right, you're not even on the stage. <laughs> but good guess, though. <laughs> you're still way high, Corey. It's 4%. 4%. And that comes from my understanding, because I looked into how they can say that. It was a study of doing questions, worldview type questions like this. That's what I'm getting at. So they would ask Christians, what's your origin? Like, where's the origin? And if you understand God created you, what does that mean? Okay, he didn't just create you. Give me another worldview that has a God creating them that doesn't understand the, the uh, image of God. It's different. What's another worldview that said God created? It's what our founders are accused of. Theistic evolution would I um yeah actually kind of, kind of would be wasn't what I was thinking of. Deism. So what's deism? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The way that you can remember it and the way that, that I've heard it taught is that God's like, you know what? Earth. And he took it. And you ever see somebody spin a basketball on their finger? Okay. That's the way I, 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 let's just see how this turns out. Okay. That he's basically doing the minimal thing he needs to, to keep everything working. But whatever happens, happens. That's deism. So there's a difference. Even when you say God created you have to get to the image of God because there's the difference, okay, between that and several other what we would call theistic worldviews, okay? So what's the meaning? Well, why are we here? Let's take another couple worldviews and, and look at them together. How does the image of God give you meaning? First R. What's that? We represent him. So how does that give us meaning, though? There's a second R? Okay, okay, I thought it was the first R. How does the fact that we represent God give us meaning? Because all the other R's. <laughs> yeah, represent is all the other R's. Why, why do you rule? You rule well because you're imaging God. Okay. Listen, how is, how is 1 Corinthians 10.31? How is Colossians 3.23? 1 Corinthians 10.31 is whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. How is that even possible? How is Colossians 3.23? Somebody want to grab that one? It's, it's the work verse. Um, I, don't, I kind of can't remember it. I know I have it memorized. Um, huh, it's on my one slide, too. It's on one of the, if you have the handout, it's on one of the slides. But how is, go ahead. How is that imaging God? How is that giving purpose and meaning? This week, or last week at work, <clears throat> we're hanging, uh, actually we're, we're installing a dryer. I just got done um, casing in a door. And I look out the window of the house we're in, and out the window I see a big groundhog. And so I holler, groundhog! And we had brought two rifles, and so my boss and I fly to the door like a couple of kids, you know, on Christmas morning. He grabs 243, I grab a 223, two groundhogs take off across the back, and we light them up like, you know, they're invading. Now, I'm going to argue that was imaging God. How? How? Perfect. Look, we're ruling over creation. We took two lives. We took two groundhogs' lives. Okay, what, is that okay to do? Why did we do that? Well, and we didn't need them. Is it okay? We were protecting farmers' fields. We, they, had, they had damaged um, buildings. Okay, so we were, we were ruling well. Do you understand? If we don't do that, the groundhogs overpopulate, and we have a major, major problem. It's our job to do that. Why is it our job? Because we are the image bearers of God and we are to take care of his creation.
creation. So that's how we eat and drink and shoot groundhogs to the glory of God. We understand that what we do. Does a person who thinks that they evolved from star gas do the same exact thing and have any purpose to it? No. He's just merely, clearing, uh, merely following the evolutionary process. I can shoot that groundhog, and there's no difference if I walk into a buffalo supermarket. Because that groundhog and I are just a different end to an evolutionary process. Okay? So image of God is how we answer origin and meaning. Okay? Now, I want you, as we're doing this, to think about other theistic worldviews that don't, un, don't teach the image of God. Um, and we don't have time today to get into those. But... Um, Think how, like, an Islamic worldview would answer origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Think about how even a Mormon um, worldview um, would answer those questions, or a Hindu worldview uh, would answer those, uh, these questions, because we all have to answer them. It's not just a Christian faith. Let's go to the next pillar. <clears throat> origin, meaning, what is it? Morality. morality. Okay, now tell me how this plays in the image of God and how we answer it versus the, uh, the humanistic worldview. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Judges says everybody did what was right in their own eyes, right? Did you get one yet, Corey? You've answered some questions. <laughs> okay. Um, great example, but what, what would you ask somebody who said everybody did what was right in their own eyes? What did they just admit to? Well, they just admitted to what? You said that they were God? Um, in some sense, they did. Ultimately, you kind of jumped four steps, but yeah. What, how did they admit that, that they were God? What did they... Right. There's right and wrong. So what, do you, what can you ask them? I heard, I heard oh, there's a lot of can't. What do we want next? <laughs> Butterfinger's good. We'll go there next. Okay. So somebody, like, doctor, did you answer one of those? I think you. <laughs> what? How do other worldviews think of Nietzsche, God is dead? Why could he confidently look at the 20th century, in the 19th century, and say, if God is dead, it'll be the most bloody century? The question to ask him is, why is that wrong? Okay? So, give me the answer that a humanistic worldview would give to how you determine morality. Do doctors eat candy? I don't even know that. <laughs> okay, so it's a personal thing. So if it sounds good to you, do it. Now, let's take these one at a time. These are really important. If somebody comes to you who's an evolutionary humanistic person and says, I determine right and wrong, but what feels good to me, what do you do? What do you say? Don't be afraid to ask questions that hit people hard. Now, okay, why do you think it's right? Even that, like, let's say, let's say the person that said that to you, their husband was a hunk. And you were like, hey, I think your husband's a hunk. Why can't I just knock you off and take him? Why can't I do that? Because if I'm stronger, the evolutionary process is what? Survival of the, that's a nice way to say the biggest, strongest, baddest bully wins. And flesh that out in worldview. If that is the way that right and wrong is determined, then Pol Pot, was that Pol Pot in Cambodia? 
He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Because why? He was the biggest, baddest dude. Millions dead at his hand, at his command. If you had glasses, if you knew like what was it above the four, whatever great education, if you were like you were dead. But not wrong because you're the strongest. So you see the answer. What's the other way that they will argue? This is the main one. This is we as Americans. We think this is how you do it. Think to the SCOTUS ruling on uh, the uh, on the definition of marriage. You guys remember where you were when they came out and said, "Okay." Bill can marry Phil, right? I know exactly where I was at that moment. Okay, but <clears throat> it's your right why. What? Because the government said it is. is. Um, yeah, but what, what, what are we getting at? It's another M word, 51%. What is it? Majority. Because so the majority of these, of this, of, of these people dressed in, in, in black robes, you know, five of the four or five of the nine said it is. And so suddenly it becomes it is, and the majority rules, right? So the major, is it okay to determine right and wrong morality by majority? Give me an example. Hit them hard. Was Hitler elected? By a what? Majority. Therefore, if Hitler was elected by a majority and we went in and took him out, who was wrong? We were. But if right and wrong was determined by might, then were we wrong? No. But we didn't act on might, right? We acted on principle that major that uh, morality is defined by who? God. So listen... Thomas Aquinas was the one that, that, that originated this argument. It's called the moral argument for the existence of God. The minute somebody says, is, you know, uh, we teach our kids to ask the question, is there anything wrong with anything? It's a great question. I mean, you, you meet the most liberal, left-wing, crazed-out, atheistic, scientist. Is there anything wrong with anything? And if they say no... And you, they've opened themselves up to all of those really, 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 really tough questions. If they say yes, where do you take it? We teach the kids a simple process. If there is something wrong with anything, how do you determine that, right? And, and, and if, if you're standard, there has to be an immovable standard by which right and wrong is determined, correct? And if there is an immovable standard, there must be what? an immovable standard giver who we define as God. And so it doesn't change. And you can easily take that discussion into the um, immutability of God, and you can easily take that into the gospel. People don't understand how important these are, even in getting to the gospel. So do you see origin, meaning, morality? What's the last one? Destiny. You know my question, what's it going to be? What's that? We determine your destiny. Okay. What does a humanistic worldview teach? Just an end. Right? Do you, and then go back to the first floorboard. The first floorboard, the two A's. Is that part then of the humanistic worldview? None. What should surprise you about the Buffalo shooting? Compare it with the Sandy Hook shooting. What's the difference? Sandy Hook shooting, guy walks in, caps 21 kids, 27 total people, and then he did what? Buffalo shooter drives a car up, gets out, right? puts the gun here, and then what didn't he do? He didn't pull the trigger. Why? Why? The Sandy Hook guy actually lived out his belief. 
The other guy was like, I'm too chicken. Because what? Romans 1. I know the law of God's written on my heart. And he will have to give an account for that. The Sandy Hook guy, I don't have to give an account. I can do whatever I want. And I can go, I'll be six feet under like everybody else. Do you, you see? So destiny, when you teach that there is life after this one, changes this one incredibly. Okay? Um, and uh, one of the one of the best ways that you can challenge um, challenge a uh, atheist um, is with the accountability question. Okay, so you're saying Hitler just gets off because he took his own life. Like that's how it ends. Like that's a bad book, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to read that book. All right, all right. Put your cards down. <laughs> Four words. What are they? Every worldview has to answer. Oh, okay. Well, then close your eyes. We can tell who the honest one is in the class. <laughs> My mom. <laughs> All right, what are they? Do it again. Destiny. Every worldview has to answer that. Use it. All right, let's go to the last. Let's go to the roof. How are we doing on time? There's 10.04. Okay. Let's go to the roof. These are a set of four questions. Again, one of our goals in our lessons that we write is to teach uh, our kids to engage, uh, teach our young men to engage, our young women to engage uh, in the battle. And to do that, you have to arm them. You have to equip them. And that's what these, that's origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And these next set of four questions, they seem incredibly simple. But they come from a man who I believe is one of the most intelligent guys I've ever heard speak. Dr. Jeff Myers from Summit Ministries is where these questions come from. And I've used them. My dad's used them. Um, I've taught them to him. We've taught them to, to um, and it's amazing how, uh, how powerful these questions can be. Okay, so you find yourselves in a conversation, and somebody says the word like, let's take it, let's, you know, the, the Supreme Court leak is on what? What, what issue? Abortion. Abortion. Somebody says, I believe that women have the right to their own body in abortion. How do you ha answer that, or, or how do you handle that? It's not their body, right? You can make statements, but teach and ask questions. <laughs> Simple question, what do you mean by that? That's question number one. What do you mean by that? What is question number one? What do you mean by that? Okay. What are you making them do? Define their terms. The left is so good at redefining everything. They want to redefine it. They want to color code it. Think about the different names of the bills that have been tried to be passed that are absolutely pure evil. But if you look at them, they sound like the greatest thing in the world. That's what they do, okay? When somebody says they are pro-choice, when you ask the question, what do you mean by that? You are forcing them to, do, to define their terms. What choice are they picking? So give me the answers of what you think a person who has a humanistic, atheistic worldview will answer when they say, I'm pro-choice, um, how will they, do, what will they say? You, they will say what? Okay. Woman, that's a, almost verbatim. Why do we know it so well? We've heard it so often. And they play it over and over and over and over again. And people listen to that and say, well, yeah, a woman, a woman does have a right. Do we believe, as Christians, that a woman has the right to do with her own body what she wants to do? Absolutely. I believe a man has the right to do with his own body what he wants to do. But I also believe because I'm created in the image of God and my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And as his image bearer, I better make choices with my body that honor and glorify him as his image bearer. Somebody grab Genesis 9, 6. We'll jump, we'll jump there, please, in, um, here in a minute. We don't disagree with the statement that a woman has a right to do with their own body. But what's the problem with that argument for abortion? When does life start? Well, when does life start? But is it really? It's not her body. 
It's not her body that she's, that she's dealing with. So you're making a statement we actually agree with. And when you're saying pro-choice, you're saying pro-death. You are for the killing of, an, of a human life. Like, quit candy coating it. Okay, so when you ask the person this simple question, teach your kids, what do you mean by that? The teacher says, well, billions and billions of years ago. What do you mean by that? Like billions and billions. How do you know? Like, like billions and billions and billions. Well, how do I even as a kid concept the, the, or, uh, understand the concept of a billion years? Like you have to help me as, as the teacher understand that. Okay, so question number one is, what do you mean by that? What's question number two? Where do you get your information from? Question one is, what do you mean by that? Question two is, well, a woman has the right to choose. And then according to um, Roe v. Wade in 19, right? Where, where did you learn what it is that you are now spitting back to me? Okay? Why did we know the answers that we know abortionists will give? Because we see it on the news. And now people will quote the news as an authoritative, you know, oh, yeah. Or there's never been a generation, I don't believe, that believe that there is actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, substance to the phrase, well, I think. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> right? Or they will say what? Science tells us. This is the great one. What do you say when somebody says, science tells me? What do you say? Okay, good. That's not what I was, <laughs> I was facing, right? Right? I would say science doesn't tell us anything. Science tells us nothing. Science is a field of study. Who tells us? Scientists. Is there any scientist, creation or not, or uh, Christian or not a Christian, it is not biased. There's not. So you're quoting me, you're quoting me a fallible human being who is uh, observing through his lens. They, if, if, you, if you do not believe, if you believe the box, um, what was that old movie that they started showing in the 70s, all the elementary kids, and it starts off with that famous humanist who says, the box is all there is. <laughs> if that's pounded in your head, when you observe a dinosaur bone, you're going to think it has to come from inside the box, even though everything inside the box screams of somebody outside the box. <laughs> you refuse to see that because you are a scientist who has a, has a predetermined, <laughs> has a filter that will not allow him to see outside the box. Does that make sense? Okay. So the, uh, you ask them where they got their information from. Where better you answer that question? <laughs> well, where do you get your information from, right? Because if you ask them, what do they go? They, they should ask you that. They have every right to ask you that. And you should say what? The Bible. And what will they so profoundly say to you? Well, they're gonna <laughs> they will. That's the next question. But they're going to say, I don't. Now, when a person says, I don't believe the Bible, what are they expecting you to do? What? They're, they're expecting you to preach to them, but when they actually say to you, like, I don't believe the Bible, what do they expect you to do? Like, what in the conversation? Who's had this said to them? They expect you to defend it or put it down. They expect you to say, well, like... I don't believe it, so you can't use it. That's what they ultimately expect. Do you do that? If you do, you've lost. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I won't use my Bible, but you can't use your scientists. Right? Okay, that's a great... Here, Dan, you like Butterfingers. <laughs> Sorry. We got some bad catch. Either I'm a horrible thrower or... or um, yeah, so don't ever lay down the sword. Don't put it down in these conversations. If you give it up, you're going to lose. It is what we fight from. It is where we say. You have to tell them, look, it's never been disproven. It's never going to be disproven. Okay? 
you, we can use example after example after example, and we don't have time today to go into a lot of those different things, but everything from the Hittites to, to creation to, has been demonstrated, can be demonstrated to be true when somebody looks at it with an open, open and honest mind. So first question is what? What do you mean by that? Second question, where do you get your information? Third question is how do you know it's true? So if you ask somebody, well, how do you know that whatever scientist you are quoting um, is true, they have the right to ask you that question, right? So if they ask you the question, well, how do you know the Bible is true, how would you answer it? Anybody even ask that question? Kind of think if that's our ground we're fighting from, probably should know the answer to it. Would you mean the inspired word of God? Yeah, they're going to say, how do you know it's inspired? Like, how, how do you know it's inspired? Because Islam believes the Quran is, like, that's their source. Joseph Smith believes the Book of Mormon, that's his book. That's where they're going to argue from. They better be able to answer why. Correct. I, I would agree with that. That's why um, cross-examined, uh, what's that guy's name? Um, cross-examined ministries, uh, the book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Uh, you know, he goes around and speaks. I can see his picture. Uh, Frank, yeah, Frank Turk, yeah. Um, phenomenal. You know, I love watching him because he's so logical in his presentations. He would do that. But that doesn't answer the question, why, you, why do you believe your sword is truth? I know it says it. I know it makes the claim. But you have to be able to give some sort of, to a person that doesn't believe it, you have to give an answer that makes sense. It's never been proven wrong. It's never been proven wrong. Correct. I think that's a great answer. How else? <laughs> right. I do. I don't remember the... I don't remember the quote, though. I'll have to find it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I w look, I would encourage you. There's got to be, you've got to make this one your own. When I'm putting this, to, like I'm putting this together, like this is you. This is you on the conversation. Frank Turk's not going to be there. I'm not going to be there. Pastor Todd's not going to be there for you. When somebody says, like you're basing your entire destiny, that fourth pillar on this book, you better know why it's true. Now, I answer the question with the prophecy. Like, hey, I look at the Old Testament, and I see, you know, we can't even tell you who, you know, like who, whatever team's going to draft, you know, whatever player they're going to draft. We can't tell you who's going to win the first game. We can't tell you simple things, okay? Look at the detail. It's been proven mathematically how impossible it is for the prophecies of the Old Testament even alone. You guys have probably seen that with the, 17 zeros and all that type of stuff. Make it your own to this question. Why do you believe it's true? And if you don't know how to answer it, I would suggest you find out how to answer that question. Okay? What's the fourth question? I'll, I'll use, uh, there was a study done in 19, I believe it was in the 1970s, that um, picked out just uh, eight of the prophecies of Christ. Um, and of course, there's over, you know, 300 of them. And just the eight coming true is the chances of one to the, to the, seven, to the power of 17 zeros. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a number so large. Like, there's not even enough. There's, there's more. That's a larger number than grains of sand on the earth. It's an absolutely incredible <laughs> Which of the eight? Yeah, you, yeah, you know, you know, a uh, 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 birthplace, you know, time, uh, peace on earth. You know, there's all those different ones that you can go into. But again, know know who know who you're talking with. Sometimes, if you're talking with a doctor who clearly wants specifics, have those ready. Sometimes you can talk to a person that just will take the general answer as well. But, again, make it your own because it is. I mean, 
Corey, is there anything more frustrating as a pastor than looking at a, at a person that says, I believe the Bible, and you say, why? And I'm like, I don't know, my dad told me to. That's a poor answer. It is. That is a great question, Abby. Like, that is a great question. And here, here's why. No, like, seriously, I would say, because of who I am, like, I don't care about your experience because you're interpreting your experience. Listen, I listened to a debate between um, the guy that has uh, reasonable faith, and I don't know, I can't think of his name. Um, but he, there was an atheist uh, debating um, William. No, 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 it was... Uh, the guy that does reasonable faith, which they do not, um, they do the, they have a phenomenal video on the fine tuning of the argument, fine tuning argument of the universe. Um, he goes by three names. He's a philosopher. Um, anyhow, I listened to his um, debate with this um, humanist, and they ask, you know, give your arguments for the existence of God or the non existence of God. The guy from reasonable faith, um, lists out five typical arguments that we get. And the fifth one that he gave was the experience. And I'm like, why did you end with that? Like, to me, that's the weakest. The humanist then gave his rebuttal to that, and he said the strongest argument to him was the personal experience, that you saw the hand of God work in your life. So I would say, depending on who you're talking to, you know, Christ interacted differently with different people. And I think we, we need to not have those. That's why we write our pods the way we do, so that they try. We don't just want these regurgitated answers. You have to make it your own. And you have to be smart enough to analyze the situation. That's why James says pray for wisdom. You know, if you're at work and you're dealing with a lady who's just been through a divorce or a loss of a child or whatever, you're going to be handling that a lot more tenderly than you're dealing with a person who's angry because they're losing their abortion rights. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's a great question. Um, and did I answer it for you? Yeah. Okay. There's an atheist scientist in, in, uh, in England that makes that point on the Truth Project. So it was incredible that the Truth Project actually interviewed this guy. And what he said is exactly what you said. He said, from a scientist mathematics standpoint, to get from just one phase of one animal to another phase, like if you're saying that the bird turned into a lizard or a lizard into a bird, whichever way it was, there's a minimum of 50,000 mutations that must take place. We don't have a fossil of a single one of those. So when you talk about the missing link, you're not missing a fossil. It's not like a half bird, half lizard. You're missing 49,999 fossils. And he said with the amount of animals that we have, all the different species, all the different kinds, if it's to be true in the numbers that we have now, every single dirt or shovel load of dirt that you dig should have fossils in it all over the planet. Does that make sense? Is that, so that's what you're saying, correct? And there, you know, there's example after example of atheistic, humanistic scientists that come across, whether it be the you know, DNA, whether it be um, one, of them, one of the famous ones was from um, his study of the eye and, and just saw one aspect of the eye and said there's no way that, that that has to be, it's out of order for what it would be in a evolutionary process and that brought him to Christ. So there's, there's, things, like, there's things like that. But my point in this is, this is you got to make it. You know, if this is what we're bank, you know, uh, banking our eternity on, you've got to be able to answer the question of why do you believe the Bible's true yourself. And there's plenty of resources out there to, to help you answer that question. Okay. Fourth question is the most overused question um, that Christians kind of know, and, and what is it? 
What happens if you're wrong? I've heard people, they get, they get caught and they can't answer a question, and so they jump to this question. Like, what happens if you're wrong? You know, like, how many of you guys know who Bill Maher is? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay, if you know him, he's a, uh, you know, very, he did a movie years ago called Religious, where he was basically trashing the church, trashing the faith, everything else. And he went and interviewed some guy. I, I don't know if he was at Sight and Sound Theater, where he was at, but he interviewed the guy who was playing Jesus, and he asked him a simple apologetic question. The guy couldn't answer it, but he jumped to this question. <laughs> and the guy said, what happens if you're wrong, Bill? Well, Bill's like, wait a minute. You didn't even answer my question. All you're doing is throwing out, who else can ask this question? Everybody can answer the question. The, you know, the humanists ask us, what if we're wrong? And you live 75 years. What have you wasted? You've wasted your one shot at 75 years, right? If a Mormon asks you, what if, what if you're wrong? It, everybody has the right to ask this question. So we use it as this fear tactic. It's not a fear tactic question. It's a concluding question. It summarizes the points that you made. Okay, and so be careful how you ask this question. Um, don't overuse it and don't jump to it without getting through the first three is the main point here. All right, let's go um, to the last thing. We're running out of time. This is the roof cap, okay? So we have to bring all of this to a conclusion. We have to make it all make sense. We have to bring it to the end, okay? So you've got, so far, you've got the simple understanding that's the principle of God. You understand that we represent God. You understand that if that's re uh, replaced or removed with different doctrines, what's going to happen to an individual's life, to a society? You got all of that. You understand how this, this one single doctrine helps us understand four questions every worldview has to, has to answer, right? It's helping you ask these questions. You've got to bring it to this conclusion, and what is that? Does life matter? Yes or no? Abby says yes. I think Abby's wrong. <laughs> Look, this best way to answer it, what's, what, is, what is the saying of the day? Like, what was the big battle? Like, like certain lives what? Matter. And what did every Christian, every Christian would, would say what in response to that? All lives matter. Okay? And all that you do is play right into the narrative when you answer that question that way. That's all you do. Play right into their hand. Okay? The better way to do it is ask the question, why do you think life matters? Because I think what matters is that you pay your electric bill on time. I think you should, you know, these menial things of life, but life itself doesn't matter. That is the understatement of the century. Life is sacred. That's where you end up. We don't even understand the term. Set and how holy and set apart this doctrine makes us. Matter, it's not wrong, it's the understatement. And what you can say is, why does any life matter? Because black lives matter are humanistic, atheistic, weird, you can even you know, argue different. But if their, if their worldview plays itself out, no life actually matters. In our worldview, the human being, the life, each and every one, from the moment of conception to the moment of natural birth, regardless of any race, color, creed, mental, physical disabilities, every single life is absolutely, unquestionably, undeniably sacred. And if you understood the glory of the sacredness of the life that's sitting beside you and that they are the image of God on man, you would never think about being unkind, disrespectful, anything like that. It would totally, radically change our country, our society, and even our world if this single doctrine was taught in that manner. I put down Psalm 8. Let's read that together as we kind of wind this thing down. When I consider the heavens, the work of the fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and that the Son of Man, that thou visit, visiteth <laughs> him. 
For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. That is the doctrine of the image of God in man, Psalm 8. Now, what questions do you have for me in this doctrine? You get it? You understand why it's so foundational? Everybody understand it? Memorize those cards. Does it help you get it, help you understand it, help you articulate it? Nobody has a single question. <laughs> what I would encourage you to do, and we have to wind down. Our time is, we have two minutes left. But, like, what I would encourage you to do is to take what you have had put before you. To sit down as a family or to sit down um, as a couple, whatever, and pull up, you know, Newsmax, the Daily Wire, Fox News, something like that, and... Look at the headline. And my challenge to you is before we started this study versus now, try to see how differently you look at those headlines in light of how many of them are directly related to a, either a no view, an, an incorrect view, or a messed up view of who man is and the doctrine of image of God is involved in that. I, it'll, be, it'll surprise you. Okay? And it's a way that you will learn to apply what you've been taught here um, at Maranatha Baptist Church. So. All right. I, I think 